Good morning, Mr. Young. I understand you have seven and a half minutes. Uh, yes, I do. Good morning. You may proceed. May it please the court. My name is Robert Young, and I represent the child in this case, Rico. In this case, the trial court identified a specific need for Rico to have post-adoption um, contact. Mr. Young, I have a question. Um, won't the DCF continue to have involvement post-adoption, at least to the extent that the court's order requires DCF to exercise discretion about post-adoption visits? Uh, the short answer is no, uh, for a I'm couple not. of reasons. If we're talking about post-termination but pre-adoption, the department is involved. They still yes, have no, I'm talking, I know your claim, okay. you, you made it very clear in your brief that your claim is about post-adoption in your main argument, I understand that. A absolutely, and post-adoption, <coughs> the, the department <coughs> will close its case. Uh, Must close its case. It has to close its case, in fact, yes, there is a regulation. Uh, it will no longer have custody. And because the parents, there's no showing that the parents, and they are unquestionably parents, now they are adoptive parents, uh, the state cannot uh, intervene <coughs> in the rights between a parent and a child unless there's been some, um, you know, reason to do so, correct? Well, that's the general principle, but as far as the, the rights mm -hmm. of the uh, adoptive parents, uh, <coughs> you have to keep in mind that the central inquiry here is mm -hmm. the best interest of the child, and the judge made a specific finding that post-adoption contact with his father was in his best no, interest. No, I'm, I'm not suggesting, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not concluding that one could never have a post-adoption order from a court, but what I'm saying is absence of a post-adoption order, there wouldn't be any further involvement of the state, uh, DCF. Correct. May I, may I ask just the big picture? What, what you wanted was the judge in the juvenile court to say, father has a right to visit with this child after they are adopted, after the child is adopted, and then the department has to go and find an adoptive family that will agree to that condition. Yes. That's basically it. Yes. Now, as a general rule, do most adoptive parents agree to a condition like that going f into it? Well, I, I think uh, if, if at the time the, the child had identified adoptive parents, uh, that maybe would have been an issue to be litigated in the trial court. Um, you have to keep in mind that at the conclusion of trial, there was no ad adoptive family. That uh -huh. was disruptive. So the judge's finding of twice a year contact wow. with his father was something that would have been right up front for any prospective family. You know, I just, realistically, wouldn't that create m more of a a problem in, find, in finding an adoptive home for a kid? Well, I think if, if, if it were truly a problem, post-termination but pre-adoption, the department could bring it forward to the judge's attention. So uh, you would say the judge makes the order, and then if it, if it is a problem, they can go back to the judge and say, judge, it's, it's a problem. Yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, adoption of Edgar uh, was essentially that circumstance. Well, I, I have a question sort of along the same lines. Isn't it premature now to make that sort of an order because this this young man may not be adopted for years. He's had several unsuccessful attempts, pre-adoptive placements. So how, and they can't find a permanent home for him yet. So how do we know what the situation will be when they finally do find a, an adoptive home for him? The father might be back in prison, so visits would be virtually impossible. Um, anything could happen between now and then. So why does it make sense now to make an order for what could be four or five years down the road and the situation would be totally different. Well, at, at the time of trial, the circumstances were that, and the, with the judge charged with evaluating his current best interests at the time of trial, were Great. disruption of the adoptive placement, his father's parental rights being terminated, strong bond, strong relationship, and attachment to his biological father. Uh, uh, these, these are all the circumstances in, present in, in veto that didn't apply on those facts clearly would apply here for entering a specific post Yeah, but it seems to me that I can understand the order now um, and going in force and effect until adoption, but several years. Pre-adoption, pre-adoption. Right, post-termination, pre-adoption. But once you get to adoption, I mean, once you get several years down the road, anything could change in a, in a situation like this. So why should the order be well, 
why should an order of visitation be made now for something that nobody knows what the situation is going to be? Because it's based on the current best interest. Post but those won't exist in, in what, when, when and if this child finally gets adopted. Well, we don't, we don't know. We don't does know. A, does but we, that's right. We don't know. So why, why do we fight about this order now when it's all, it's all so hypothetical? Well, I think quite simply, if, to keep in mind, is that that order really shouldn't be considered as a forever order. The adoptive parents, if there's an issue, you know, they're, they, they step into the roles of parent all the fundamental rights. Right. If they're concerned that this child's best interest is being impacted by ongoing contact with his father, I, I would submit that they could uh, essentially file a complaint Yeah, but then why are you contesting it now? Because you don't know if it will be in his best interest either by the time he finally, if ever, gets adopted. Or contesting it because at the time of trial, it was in his current best interest, and the judge made a specific finding that it was in his best interest and but laid I out agree, a schedule. But I agree, but that's, but that's pre-adoption. Mr. Young, may I ask you a I question? Know, yes. It seems to me that um, if you look at this through the best interests of the child, one thing we do know, I think, for children is that some sense that their world will not fall apart is very important to them. And it seems to me that if you're saying as a father in a pre adoptive situation and he is the only father that this child knows at that point is if you're saying to this child well I'm your father until until something else happens it's a very painful message for most children I will be here for you until until I can't be here anymore for you that seems to me what is underlying the claims here of this child. Do you, I understand you represent the father. No, I represent the child. Uh, the, the child. Is there anything in the record, this is a very experienced uh, judge obviously, is there anything in the record that says, I understand that at the moment it is in the child's best interest to continue this relationship. But I also find as a fact that it is important to this child that absent some other compelling interest that this child be able to maintain a relationship with the father until the child is reaches majority. Uh, yes, there are. Uh, there's, uh, I, I would point the court to the uh, findings and the testimony by uh, Christine Klein, the uh, department's own expert who evaluated the child in 2005. Uh, in, in, her, in the conclusion of her uh, evaluation, which is in the record at page 416, uh, she comments that it's important to avoid creating pressure uh, for this child to be disloyal to his parents and siblings, and I'll quote this, who are very much a part of his psychology. Did the judge make that finding? She, she credited uh, Christine Klein's, that's in the record itself in the psychological evaluation. Uh, she, she credited uh, testimony from the expert as to working therapists. Did the judge adopt the that finding you just read to us? She, she did not in so many words. She had that report. She made a finding that it was important for the child to be able to integrate his past and present uh, situations, mm -hmm. knowing and, and having an attachment to his biological parents as well as these transitions he's gone on through five different placements. Over can, the I, years. can I ask she, you two questions with respect to that? First is, was there a request for a post-adoption order? It, it was litigated. There it was extensive testimony. And did the judge believe she had the authority to enter a post-adoption order of contact between the child and the father? Well, that's a good question. Uh, her conclusions of law don't cite veto, for instance, anyway. Right, and was, there, was there a discussion, I, if I look at the record, was there a concern expressed by the judge yes. that she did not have the authority to enter a post-adoption contact order? No, no, no. In fact, she, she commented at the conclusion of the trial that she recognized that this child was going to go through a, quote, a very traumatic No, no, time. I understand the factual thing. I'm trying to figure out the legal basis. Did she, did she conclude that no post-adoption order should enter because she, she thought she she had the authority but concluded it was not in the child's best interest or because she didn't have the authority to enter such an order? Well, she did make an order, but it was a generic open-ended order that applied to the, the multiple fathers and children in the case. And she used the language at the end of that, that so long as it remains in the child's best interest or the children's best interest. 
but she did not specifically zero in on Rico and his father's relationship. But she did have a specific finding on page 73 of her decision that it is the opinion uh, the court finds that this child should have post-adoption contact with mother and his father, and it should occur face-to-face -face visits at least twice a year. Absolutely, but that finding and never made it to the, the, the end of the, the, end, the order to enter a decree where she then says uh, it, it's so long as it's deemed appropriate by the department and the adoptive families and it remains in the best interest of the children. She didn't zero in, and if it's clear in the record and the findings that there were other circumstances for the other children where post-adoption contact was not Did you go back and point that out to the judge? Did, did the, the finding that Judge Botsford just referred to that the judge found was not included in part of the order? Did, did I go back to the judge? Yes. No, no, I did not. Uh, the, the child was, was originally an appellee by default and uh, upon it becoming clear that he had this interest, uh, pursued, pursued that in the appeals court. Thank you, Mr. Young. Thank you. Ms. Kaiser? Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Jean Kaiser, and I represent the father in this case. Um, with respect to Ch Chief Justice Marshall's question about um, whether the trial judge thought that she had the uh, capacity, the authority to enter an order governing post-adoption or post-termination contact. I think um, the, the findings and the conclusions of law are very unclear on that. And the appeals court in its decision speculated that the reason that the judge did not issue a, a specific order governing post-adoption, post-termination contact between Rico and his father was because um, she believed that his best interests could change over time. Yes. How, however, uh, that is purely speculation because there's nothing in the conclusions of law that let us know that that's what the judge was thinking. And I think that's a big part of the problem um, with the order in this case. May I just uh, ask you these questions? First, do you agree with Mr. Young that the only issue under consideration now is post-adoptive contact? Your Honor, I think that there should be a specific order governing no, post-termination and post-adoption contact. There was an order for post-termination, correct? For po the same order applies. Okay. Post-termination at the discretion of the department, post-adoption at the discretion of the pre-adoptive parents. Could I ask you this? Assuming that we're looking only at the post-adoptive um, at the post-adoptive piece of this, and I understand that you're saying there's also a post post-termination pre-adoption piece, but just looking at the post-adoption, what standing does your client have to raise that claim? Well, Your Honor, my client is an appellant in, the, in this action. Uh, no, no, I understand. I mean, I'm and not part of the action was the adoption plan, and part of the adoption plan is the order with regard to post-termination, post-adoption contact. I understand contact. that, but does your client have any standing? I mean, I'm not suggesting that your client doesn't have standing to raise pre-adoption. Does your client have any standing to raise any claim with respect to post-adoption claims? Yes, Your Honor, I believe he does. And for this On what reason, basis? Because at the time of trial, when, when, when the father was a litigant in this, in this action, uh, he had the ability pr to propose an adoption plan, which could include, under adoption of veto, post-adoption contact, so that now he has he, he clearly has the right to do that at trial. Right. And so I think at this juncture when we're looking to to whether the case should be remanded for further proceedings, he does have standing to assert that the adoption plan should include post adoption contact because that would serve the best interests of the child. It is true that his interests have been terminated. Um, nonetheless, uh, in looking at the the best interests of the child, I think he, he can assert the position that this does protect the best interests of the child to have the continuing contact. Because as Your Honor said, this is a child who has been in foster care for a long time. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if and when he will be adopted. Um, there could be many years uh, between now and the time he reaches the age of majority. And this, the, the father, no matter what his shortcomings, um, has been the one person that has been a part of his life from the beginning. 
um, the one person who has loved him throughout his lifetime. So, so what, what is the basis for the standing? I mean, his rights have been terminated. Is he a de facto parent at this point? No, Your Honor, I don't think he's a de facto parent. I don't think his standing lies in the fact that he has an interest that he can put forward in maintaining his relationship with the child. However, as a litigant in the case wherein he had the ability to um, litigate the adoption plan, I believe that he does have the standing to say that the adoption plan should include both post-termination and post-adoption contact. I, underst uh, I understand that. C can I just move it back one basis? If the, uh, <laughs> it's, it's complicated because when the proceedings are going on in the juvenile court, as they did in this case, we're dealing with, we're dealing with termination of parental rights, and so in essence what the judge has to do is both make a determination of the termination of parental rights, but also look to see what else is available. What's the basis for saying that the parent, and I understand that in that, the course of that, the, the father who's there represented and is in the courthouse can comment on the post, on the adoption plan, but what's the basis for that? What is the basis for the father? Because at, at that juncture, the question is both whether the father's uh, rights should be terminated, which the father here, of course, contested, but also if his rights are terminated, what should happen to the child next? Yes, I, I understand that that is going on at the same time. But what's the basis for saying that the father or any parent, any biological parent, where the issue is termination, has the right to um, to establish what the what the post termination relationships will be. Well, I think it's because it is all a part of the litigation, and that's why this order, a more specific order, should have been entered at the time of trial, even though. Uh, it does require a certain degree of projecting into the future as to what the child's best interest will be. So it's because the litigation hasn't been completed. I mean, if, if there were a direct appeal, uh, if, if following an appeal, if, if, if there were no post-adoption rights declared, um, two years down the road, there still is some informal contact. W would, would the father have standing at that point to, to come in and ask for, for post-adoption visitation? No, Your Honor. I think if this case had ended um, with the, uh, with, with every court that he appealed to yeah. saying um, no post-adoption contact, that he would not, you know, at the point at which the child might be adopted, have the standing to say that um, the post-adoption contact should occur. And I think that's an important reason why the order has to be issued at the termination of the trial. That's when the judge has, the, has all of the information before him or her with regard to the child's psychological uh, development, the need for continuing contact with the father, um, the need for, uh, for that continuity in his life. As Vito said, the need for continued contact with the parent to help them navigate the move into a new home. Uh, I think that is all before the judge at that time. The judge can issue an order that would govern the child's current best interest. As child's counsel said, that can always be revisited, but it can't necessarily, we can't necessarily go back now. If, if this litigation were to conclude without a more specific order being issued. So, so ref refresh my memory, is, is, an, is an order of termination an interlocutory order? Uh, or or do, you, do you have to, does the, does the right of appeal continue through the, the, the 2103 fi uh, order? No, I think the termination order is a, fi is a final, final order. order. And it, it, I, I think it would be, I think what I would say is that once this appeal to this court is decided, the father's rights will be extinguished. Um, I have a question that I asked Mr. Young, and I'm still confused about it. I asked about why the, um, <coughs> Why, um, well, about D DCF having to exercise some discretion about post-adoption visits and why, um, why wouldn't DCF continue involvement? And he said because they wouldn't have any involvement post-adoption, but I'm reading in from number 16 of the judge's findings. The court approves of post-adoption contact with the known parents <coughs> as long as it is deemed appropriate by the department and the adoptive families. Are you saying that the judge didn't have any authority to enter that order? 
the part of it that says as long as it's deemed appropriate? Actually, Your Honor, I think it's a little, uh, I think it's a little unclear what the judge meant there. If she was referring to the, if she was referring to the discretion of the department in terms of the post-termination period before the child was adopted, and no, then no, to- No, 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 it's not unclear because she says the court approves of post-adoption contact. And it's very clear that at least in this, fine, in this, whatever she calls it, this is a part of her decree. In number 16, in order and decree that she's talking about post-adoption. Because she says as long as it is deemed appropriate by the department and the adoptive families and it remains in the best interest of the children. So is, uh, is your and the, and, the father and the child's position that the department has no authority after adoption? Well, typically, Your Honor, what would happen once the child was adopted, the department would drop out um, and they would have no authority. So and I'm not sure- So that part of her order, you would argue, is ultra-virus? Yes, that, 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 that essentially, and that's a, a large part of the problem with the order as it um, is presented here, is that it, it injects the department into the adoptive parent's lives um, but in a very non-specific way. It gives the, it, interestingly, it gives, let's say that the um, judge had just ordered two visits a year with the, post, with the adoptive parents. Um, that would have been a certain level of intrusion into the adoptive parents' life, but they would have adopted Rico subject to knowing that. Um, how however- an, How can you make an order for people who aren't before you? Well, I, I think what, what needs to happen in these post-adopt, obviously that gets reevaluated at the 210-3 uh, proceeding when the child is adopted to make sure that it's still in the child's best interest. I take it that you would say something like the following. Uh, the, the court orders that the child be made available for adopt adoption subject to the order that the child um, have an opportunity to meet with whatever the, have contact with the biological father twice a year in, in under conditions supervised by the department or something like that. Correct? Th that's correct. So your, your issue is not whether or not she had the authority to issue a post-adoption order, but just that this is so mushy that it's sort of like an order, but it isn't. That's exactly right, Your Honor. The, the, the problem is, is that this does not, the, the order that was issued does not sufficiently protect Rico's best interests because it leaves so much to the discretion of the parties involved. Could, could I just follow up on one thing you just said? So your view is that the juvenile court judge makes the order and then at the point in the future when there is going to be an adoption that the probate court judge will review the order. Well, and, and so it's not binding. It, it doesn't control. The judge reevaluates the order at that point in time. Yes, these, ju these orders are always subject to reevaluation, whether they're post-adoption or post-termination, um, because for, for the, the concerns expressed by the panel that a child's best interests can change, change. over time. Yeah. However, I think what would be important here would be for the adoption judge to have before him or her that order sa saying that the child should have contact um, with the at father. At this point in time. At this point in this time. This viewed as uh, in the child's best Right, and the, and, the, and the judge can certainly uh, look at new information that might, uh, might counsel that that order should be changed in some way, um, but at least the order is there to provide. Well, the finding the, is there. And the finding is there, and, 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 but the, the specifics are left to DCF and the well, and that, 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 that raises the whole question of what does this finding mean? And I, I think it would be uh, advisable and, and really what should happen here is that that finding should have been incorporated into an order. And just, um, I, I. Possibly there was some, I'm sorry. Uh, it seems that maybe there was some confusion in the judge's mind about um, post-termination, pre-adoption contact with the father and post-adoption. Did anybody, did you go back? I know that we've asked um, Ms. DeYoung that question, but did you go back and ask the judge to clarify this? No, Your Honor, I was not trial counsel and, and at the appellate level before the appeals court, the father was contesting his term, the termination altogether. Um, so it was a somewhat different scenario um, at that point. But so, so no, the, the, the answer to that question is th that no one asked the- So now he's changing his appellate posture, is that what you're saying? Well, yes, yeah, the, the, the father has decided not to contest the termination 
uh, beyond the appeals court. But only to contest the... Uh, to con but it seems to me that there's a, a great deal of confusion here and that the place to have addressed this might have been or might still be at the trial court. Well, I think it, it, it might still be. I think that at this point the case should be remanded uh, to the uh, trial court uh, for, a fu for entry of a specific order upon RICO's current best interests. Thank you, Ms. Kaiser. Good morning, Ms. Balakrishna. Good morning. Uh, may it please the court, Anapurna Balakrishna, on behalf of the Department of Social, uh, sorry, Children and Families. Um, good morning. Um, I'd like to first address perhaps Justice Cowan's question about what exactly paragraph 16 probably means in the um, we juvenile don't court's decision. We generally don't want oh. probabilities when it's oh. a court order, but you can try us. <laughs> well, this case involved four children some of whom were going to be adopted and some of whom weren't. Um, this particular child was not going to be adopted. His two younger half-brothers were. At that were. time? At that time, yes, Your Honor, at that time. His two younger brothers were. So in making that order, the judge was referring to all of their children and all of their potential custodians. When you read that sentence along with the fact finding, 218, in which the court found that post-adoption contact would be in this child, Rico's best interest. If you read that fact finding, along with the paragraph 16 in the adjudication commitment in order to enter decrees, it's very clear that this court was speaking about, the uh, about Rico's custodian, which in this case would be DCF. I'm, I'm sorry? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't quite, I followed you up until the very So did end. I. <laughs> We followed you until the very end, so try redoing the very end again. This child didn't have an adoptive family, so right. this juvenile court couldn't have been referring to his adoptive family. But, this but, the, but the contemplation was that he was going to have one, right? If he had one. Well, but I mean, all the way through here, I mean, there was one, it, that didn't work out. But no, I, it didn't. I mean, I, the way I read this, everybody was contemplating that and hoping that there would be one in the future. Yes, they were contemplating and hoping that there would be one in the future, but at the point in this particular case, there had been, been one. Just a couple months before the end of trial in this case, or right at the end of trial in this case, that family had um, pulled out. But Ms. let me ask you this. I'm just suggesting what I'm reading from the child's point of view. Mm -hmm. The child says to the father, are you always going to be here for me? And what the child is looking for is an answer, yes, no matter what. Whether you are in a foster ho home or an adoptive home, because we don't know at the time. How old was this child at the time? At the, at the end of the trial, the child was nine. How old was the child at the beginning? At the beginning of the proceedings in this case? Well, the trial lasted about six months, so he would have been around eight or nine. And how old is the child now? It's going to be 12, March 28th. Okay. So if between nine and 12, children often often, often, I'll even take judicial notice of that, say, will you always be here for me, especially frightened children, children who are moving around? What is the father supposed to say to this child accurately? Ac accurately. So that he doesn't mislead the child. What can the father say? That I will always be here for you. But if there's no post-adoption order, that is not an accurate statement. How can any father say it? I mean, any father, heaven forbid, could drop dead the next day or the next year. I mean, we have that all the time. I don't understand how any father can honestly say that to a child. Emotionally? that and, and particularly this father who doesn't know, you know, next year he might be incarcerated again. So I don't see how any parent can say that to a child with honesty. Even with the order, Your Honor, if an order had entered saying that this child will have contact twice a year, the father still could not say that because such orders are subject to revision with the child's changing best interests. Every year under 29B, the um, permanency, planning. permanency planning at the permanency planning hearing, this order will have to be revisited. If this child is adopted, the order would have to be revisited. It doesn't matter. Okay, well, that's a question that I asked at the beginning. If this order has to be revisited at the time of um, adoption, then why are we fighting about this now? Because it's all, it's all hypothetical. 
it is all hypothetical so because why, why is why is I don't I'm that's what I don't understand and I'm afraid I don't have an explanation from anybody. I mean, is it true that it's revisited at the time of adoption? One brief says the time of adoption is just a happy issue and nobody wants to get into details like this. Adoption is a legal proceeding, Your Honor, and in some cases where there are no issues, the adoption hearing is, in fact, a legalization ceremony with cakes and celebrations and balloons. But on the other hand, it is an opportunity for an active child's counsel to bring before the adoption judge the issue of whether the post-adoption um, visitation remains in the child's best interest. That would happen before the legalization hearing. Well, so it's an opportunity to address these issues. That is what the department's position is in this case. Well, that also seems to be what uh, Ms. Kaiser said. Uh, she said the order would get reevaluated by the probate court in the 2103 hearing uh, at the time the adoption was going to be uh, resolved. So I guess everybody. A 210 five hearing, Your Honor? Yes. yes. That's, for that reason, the post, any order issued by the termination judge mm -hmm. at most is really a recommendation for the adoption judge what, uh, about what might be needed at that time. But it does at least tell the probate court what the juvenile court thinks is in the child's best interest at the time the, court is, the juvenile court is making the order. And that adoption judge, Your Honor, also has that fact finding 218 that says post adoption contacts appears to be in this child's best interest. They ha the adoption judge has that finding. The adoption judge also has the entire decision. And the child's counsel can bring that all to the attention if the um, department's adoption plan, which is filed at the time of the adoption, doesn't address post adoption visitation. Yeah, but it's, it's a very ambiguous. What's being brought to the attention of the adoption judge is pretty ambiguous. On the one hand, you've got a finding that this judge finds that at least twice a year post-adoption, uh, Rico and his father should have face-to-face -face visits, and then a, a you know an order or an adjudication that says, yeah, it's up to the parents in the department. You know, I mean, so that they're. If I were the adoption judge, I would not exactly be clear on where I was, you know, what, the, what the lead was. The termination judge, Your Honor, can only assess what is in front of him and her. And at that point in time, that termination judge can look at the facts in front of him or her and decide, at this time, this is what this Agreed. child needs. Agreed. I'm just saying, it's mm -hmm. I if, I were, if I were looking at this after the fact, mm -hmm. the way that it is structured, it's, it's ambiguous as to what the termination judge meant. At the time of the adoption, the child's <laughs> counsel can bring all of this to the attention of the adoption judge, and an assessment of the child's needs at that time can occur. You're surely not suggesting that there be a whole new trial. No, I'm not suggesting there be a new trial, Your Honor, but the child's counsel does have the opportunity to bring a motion before the judge for these issues to be considered what in, about connection the in connection with the specific adoption plan that's going to be considered at that time. Yes, Your Honor. What about the father? Would he have standing at that time? The department's position is the father does not have standing. When his rights are terminated, his, all of his rights regarding this child are extinguished. I believe adoption of Helen stands for that proposition as well. Um, the father doesn't have standing. This, this order is not for the father. The father is mainly the vehicle in which this child's best interests are served. Ms. Balakrishna, could I ask you this with respect to the appeals court's decision? In addressing whether there was error in leaving uh, post-adoption visitation between the father and the child to the discretion of DSS and the future adoptive parents, the appeals court says, and I quote, Rico's adoptive parents will be in the best position to determine what visitation is in the child's best interests as he grows up. Do you agree with that? I believe also that that is this court's position, took the same position in veto, that um, the child custodian. I'm just custodian asking whether you agree with that statement. DSF, DCF agrees with that statement and has advocated for that in a number of other appeals court cases. So I take it because they then go on to say, the appeals court says, whereas here the adoptive parents have not yet been located, discretion as to what schedule for post-termination visitation continues to be in the best interest can appropriately be left to DSS. <laughs> if I were to read the appeals court's decision 
I would say what the appeals court was saying is that post-adoption, <laughs> post-adoption, DSS really is not in the best position to determine uh, what is in the best interest of the child. Would you agree with that? Yes, Your Honor. Post-adoption, DCF is not involved. This child has parents at that time. So in that regard, paragraph 16, mm -hmm. that the court approves of post-adoption contact mm -hmm. as long as it is deemed appropriate by the department. That is what the order says. Correct, Your Honor. But that is, okay. your position is that is an incorrect, that order should not have entered to the extent that it's an order. This court, Your Honor, this um, trial court in this case, did not distinguish between post-adoption and post-termination. No, 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 that, well, it's not clear that she whether did because this is, mm -hmm. this is a particular Mm -hmm. um, I, I would take it as an order that she approves mm -hmm. post-adoption contact as long as it is deemed appropriate by the department and the parents. And uh, that seems to be no. not the reading that the appeals court has given it and not the reading that yeah. you are advocating here. If you read, uh, sorry, uh, um, my reading of the entire decision, Your Honor, is that this judge, it's semantic. She didn't say post-termination visitation anywhere. She treated the entire subject of visitation as she called all post-termination visitation, post-adoption visitation. She was very clear that there was no adoptive family for Rico. Oh no, I that. take it that your beginning point was if you look at 16 in context, 16 relates to all of the children, some of whom are going to be adopted directly and some Rico Some of whom had not. people waiting to adopt them. And so uh, depending on what their status will be after mm -hmm. these proceedings, the department will be the arbiter, so to speak, Even or the adoptive parents, depending on what their status correct, is. Correct, Your Honor. And also, before an adoption can occur, according to the statute, the um, child must live with the adoptive parents for six months, and at that point, DCF is still involved. Obviously, the adoption okay. hasn't happened yet, but uh, my point is was at the very beginning that in this paragraph 16, it relates to all the children, and the judge, it was very clear that the judge knew that Rico didn't have adoptive parents yet and that DCF would still be involved. What, what is the status now of, 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 the child. Been, of the child? I don't have any information on that other than that at the appeals court argument, it was, um, I think it was suggested that the child was in a pre-adoptive home, at least at the end of trial, not at the end of trial, but before the decision entered. There was some, um, and it is in the record that there had been an adoptive parent family identified for this child um, and that the Rico was receiving monthly visits with his father. That was information that was um, offered at the appeals court. Um, DCF in its adoption plan committed to recruit or try their best to recruit a family that would be sensitive to this child's need, which was very important because the last family to have this child before trial ended chose to give him up because they couldn't handle part of his connection. So it was very clear that if this child is going to be adopted by a family, it most likely would be adopted by one sensitive to his needs to maintain that connection. Help me to understand what your position is. If the probate court judge finds in the best interest of the child that there should be some post-adoption contact, mm -hmm. is it your view that the judge then has an obligation to issue an order or that the judge can simply rest upon that finding with the mm -hmm. expectation that, the time, that at the time of adoption, that judge will use that finding to issue a post-adoption order. DCF's position, Your Honor, is that finding and this order is really a recommendation for the adoption judge as to what this judge found in with the facts in front of him or her and what should continue to happen in the future depending on the evolving best interest of the child. That will change necessarily. Now, now with, the, with the statute, though, that same judge at the time of, uh, of eliminating the uh, terminating the parents' rights would have to make a decision as to the siblings, would sh she not? Um, the statute, the statute <coughs> 119 section 26 deals with the siblings um, and that statute directs that as at any time that it's practical, the judge should decide whether or not sibling visitation is in order and if the judge decides that sibling visitation is in order, the judge should set a schedule um, that's a reflects a decision by the legislature that that is the duty of the judge. The legislature has not amended the statute to involve parents in such a decision. Um, so 
the judge's obligation is to act in the best interest of the child. There is no obliga obligation, either from this court or from the statute, stating that the judge has an obligation to enter an order for post-adoption visitation at any time. The statute doesn't comp contemplate post-adoption parental visitation at all, except as voluntary between the adoptive parents and the um, biological parents, and that's the only place. Okay, so, so go ahead. Well, I just want to follow up on that. So, so with respect to siblings, whether or not it's post-adoption, post-termination, is it the siblings? Let's say it's post-adoption. So DCF is not involved with this child. It, the siblings would go to court under Section 26? Is that there's an order. In for, that's an or, there's an order. Those siblings are the beneficiaries of that order. But I just, just uh, hypothetically, I mean, mm -hmm. forget this. Just you have a child who's been adopted. Mm -hmm. um, siblings are elsewhere. Those siblings at any point in time could go into court and say, under this section, we, we want to establish visitation with our siblings? That would have already happened, I believe, Your Honor. Um, or are you saying if the siblings are if out in the world? There was no existing order, I think, is Justice yeah. Boxford's question. There's no existing order? Well, the statute says that when the siblings are separated, that's when the judge should assess the situation um, and determine whether or not um, that whatever the earliest possible situation. And in this case, there was actually an order. It's not clear in the record, but it's referred to um, that there was an order between uh, the older brother and the younger brother that there was an existing order and that happened when they were separated. So there was an order and ostensibly the child, the s whoever is beneficiary of the order has standing to go into court and ask that it be enforced. Thank you, Ms. Bowdy. Thank you, Your Honors.